I'm Professor David Scott at the Center for Marine Geology at Dalhousie University in Halifax. Uh, I generally have an interest in quaternary geology. I've never looked very much at coral. My interest in deep sea coral came in 1995 when two fishermen called me one day and they said they had these buried forests in 300 meters of water and I'd never heard of anything like that. They, uh, I said, well, why don't you bring this up? Uh, to Halifax next time you come up. So Ralph Sanford Atwood and Ralph Atkinson came up to Halifax and they brought this piece of coral up, uh, which I'd never seen anything like it. I looked at it and I said, that's not a tree, that's a deep sea coral. And after that, I didn't know very much about deep sea coral. I started calling around to colleagues in the uh, Smithsonian Institution and over in Norway found out the deep sea corals were quite well known, but not very well known off Nova Scotia or off Canada, for that matter at all. And started looking around. We went down to Barrington Passage, where these fishermen were from, talked to those fishermen, because a lot of them had a very extensive knowledge of this coral. They'd been, in one case, Sanford Atwood's family had been fishing out there for almost 100 years and been bringing this coral up for a long time, but they'd always been told it was petrified wood. And we first got interested in Canadian corals when we would see them on the wharves as children, ask the fishermen what they were, they would say trees, you know, they were really quite beautiful. As amateur scientists and professional fishermen, we decided to study these creatures on our own, photograph them, document them the best way we can and then eventually we were asked to go to schools to show the children that Canada has corals. My first involvement with coral was when my father, when I was a kid, my father brought it home. And I usually asked a lot of questions, you know, like, what is it, where did it come from? He said it was tree, petrified trees. So I kept believing it was petrified trees. And I believed that for years until the day I took a piece down to Dalhousie in Halifax and I met Dave Scott and presented the piece to him and he was very excited because he said it was coral and I was too when he told me it was coral. I mainly dominated this inshore grounds roughly you know two anywhere from two to twenty miles off and we noticed a lot lots and lots I'd get twenty or thirty a day of these little strawberry corals some bigger of little corals and on a rock, they'd unhook them on and go back. And his head was all on flat bottom, which we call drag a bottom, because it's the same kind of gravelly bottom that haddock tend on. So this is where we fished them. And when we go and fish for these haddock, now there's no haddock. There's no strawberries. It's like a garden out there. They're ripping in, tearing it right to pieces. Nothing's going to survive. Our fishing's had it and it's going down big time if they continue dragging, right? For a number of years I've been working on, on fisheries issues and attending meetings and uh, fishermen would come in, uh, particularly hook and line fishermen, uh, really distraught at the, what they perceive a lot of damage being done to the ocean floor by dragging. In particular, of course, the, uh, what really spurred us was the work of the Canadian Ocean Habitat Protection Society, the work that uh, Derek Jones was doing and, and Sanford Atwood. And, I mean, they had the specimens and they had them mount and, mounted and displayed. And in the fishing community, I must say that it's... Uh, it's not a big secret, or it's not only one or two individuals that knows about these corals. Anybody who's been fishing on the edge of the Scotian Shelf uh, knows about them. If you talk to American fishermen, oh yeah, they'll say, oh yeah, I know those trees. So um, within the, I mean, it's a kind of interesting because within one community, if you like, the fishing community, there's all kinds of knowledge about certain aspects of these corals. And yet we had scientists, say at DFO or at the, uh, at the university, who uh, didn't know of their existence in Canadian waters. Well, after a number of interviews with fishermen, both by ourselves and by the Ecology Action Center, the Ecology Action Center decided they would try to organize a conference on deep sea corals. And it turned out there was an incredible amount of interest, much more than I would have imagined. So that by the summer of 2000, we had participants from around 30 countries coming to Halifax for the first international conference on deep sea coral. Quite an amazing conference. Uh, I was amazed, at least, by the diversity of the corals and by what these corals look like in the deep sea. They look just like a shallow water coral reef, except you don't, you're below, way below the photic zone. 
On the continental shelves of Nova Scotia, we find coral forests. These are structurally complex. Imagine, they're, they're really like trees. Each of the individual coral colonies is like a tree. And there's uh, many, many of these, they create a forest. And in this forest, among the trees of the forest, we find fish, we find invertebrate organisms such as basket stars. We find a whole complex of ocean organisms. And just as a forest provides, just as a forest of trees provides for richness on land, um, many, many niches for many kinds of organisms, so the trees of the continental shelf, the coral trees of the continental shelf, provide us with rich habitat for many organisms in the ocean. You know, imagine what happens, well, I'm sure you're familiar with what happens if you cut down all of the trees in a forest. We have no places anymore for birds and so on. And the same happens in the bottom of the ocean. If we knock down all the trees, as happens with, as the coral trees, as the fishermen call them, as happens with uh, some kinds of fishing gear, for example, then we have no forest left and no place for these many, many kinds of organisms that live on the bottom of the ocean. One of the nice things about working with modern reef corals is that they're like environmental tape recorders. They grow like an onion or a, or a tree would be a better example. They add bands every year, and these bands are about a centimeter in thickness. So if you go back in time, if you wanted to find out uh, whether the sun was shining in April 1944, you can go back and you can do that with a reef coral. And we had no idea whether this was going to be possible with deep water corals. It turns out that it will be possible. It's going to be a, a heck of a lot harder with deep water corals than it is with reef corals. But we can determine centuries-long temperature records and centuries-long productivity records. But we need to get the samples. <clears throat> My colleague at uh, McMaster University, Mike Risk, and his associate Jody Smith were the ones that pioneered this technique on how to get the record out of these corals. And we're going to use, they have a minute drill, which can get at each one of these layers, which are only about 200 microns thick. So you need a very small drill to drill individual layers get the record out of each one of these layers. And then we heard about these strange deep water corals in Norwegian fjords. That was the beginning of the 90s. And so we rented a camera, lowered it, and there they are. These deep water reefs of unexpected dimension and structuring and rich in biodiversity. And we all are aware that climate change can occur not within thousands of years, but even within tens of years. Well, following the Coral Conference, this piqued a lot of interest with a lot of people, including some of the government agencies. Um, of course, we noticed when we were at the Coral Conference, there was a lot of video of other deep sea coral reefs, but there's none off Canada. So we had a sort of an inkling of what these should look like, but all we had were pieces of coral like this that the fishermen had brought us. We had no idea what this coral would look like in, in its forest, in its setting on the seafloor. So, but to do that, you need a submarine or a remotely operated vehicle. These cost a lot of money to mobilize and a lot of money to get out here. And it took another year after that to actually get that money together, get the equipment together, and actually get out to look at these things. And the result is what you're going to see in a few minutes, in a few seconds, is deep sea video, the very first deep sea video taken of corals off eastern Canada. And you'll see an amazing diversity of corals. This diversity of corals that you'll be seeing in this video is occurring right in the front edge of the Scotian Slope, where you see the label of Northeast Gully, or Northeast Channel, with the two arrows. And it's right along that break at about 500 meters of water depth. And the currents here are extreme. The Bay of Fundy empties in and out of this channel, the Northeast Channel, has the highest tides in the world. And it actually prevented us from staying on the bottom very long because the ship would move the ship and the vehicle. But what you'll see is huge amounts of material in the water. And that's why these corals do so well here, is there's lots of particulate water material in the water that they can feed on. Well, we were finally successful in getting a ship that could handle a, a remotely operated vehicle, the Martha L. Black from the Quebec Division of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. We had a staff uh, from Dalhousie University, Memorial University, McGill University, but I think most importantly we had a representative from the fishing industry, the guy who actually helped us find this stuff. 
We also had representatives from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the uh, Geological Survey of Canada. The vehicle we're using is called ROPOS. It's a remotely operated platform of ocean science run out of the Can Canadian Submersible Facility in Vancouver. It has many different kinds of sampling devices, which you'll see in this video. It has two 40-horse motors on the back, and the umbilical cord that you saw is what powers this vehicle and allows it to stay on the bottom much longer than manned submersibles might. Well, when we first got to the seafloor at 500 meters water depth, this is what we saw. The coral in the distance is about two meters high. It's called pink coral or paragorgia. Small corals in the foreground are Peminoa, which are the ones that we were interested in because these are the ones that have the climate record. You see all the fish swimming around. The white coral is probably the same species as the pink one, we're not sure. And you can see several different kinds of coral living in the same place. And you see all the fish. This answered one of the first questions is, are these corals fish habitat? And you'll see throughout this video that fish are everywhere around these corals. As we get a little bit closer to the coral, you see this fish nestling in the coral, just like a bird in a tree. And this was a pretty common sight. The shrimp you see swimming around in the front they seem to be attracted to light. Even though they never see light, they were attracted to it, and so were a lot of these fish. You might notice just the huge numbers of fish. When you went away from these coral, you just didn't see very many fish. Fish were also attracted to light. They may have seen light. They may go up to the surface, but certainly not often. There's a huge amount of sea life around these corals. There's at least two different kinds of corals that you see in the front. These are hard corals. They have a hard calcium carbonate skeleton. This white coral you see here is sort of spongy, and there you see a fish. It gives you a good idea of the scale of this large paragorgia. Looking at another coral, we see a sea urchin and a little tunicate hanging onto it there, and all the usual shrimp and associated other organisms. Here we see some individual corals. We see two different types of things, polyps of these hydrozoans. A little bit of a close-up, you can see them out. And here you see a really close-up, and then you see that one contract. As the vehicle approaches, you can see another large piece of paragorgia coral, again, probably two meters high almost, polyps fully extended. This is often called bubblegum coral or strawberry coral because of its color. Uh, when it dries up, it looks much different than this. You see fish everywhere swimming out of it, lots of shrimp in it, a uh, little needlefish swimming by here. Well, of course, we weren't just down here to take pictures. We also wanted to get some sampling. This is the clipper arm or sampling arm. There's two of these on this vehicle. It's able to go and clasp uh, small, large things, rocks. In this case, a piece of coral that we want, that we need to be able to do our climate records on the base of this coral. You see on this piece of coral, uh, the actual, the original living coral seems to be restricted only to the tips. There's soft coral hydrozones have taken over part of the skeleton. This seemed to be a common phenomena, is that when the uh, original coral would die, these original skeleton would be taken over by these other uh, animal forms. Still, the animal form or the skeleton still maintained, however, a uh, good living space for all the fish. What's going to happen now is we have to position the, the vehicle. Uh, there's a little bait box you'll see in the front. These, the top will open. And what we attempt to do then is stick the material into the bait box, close the top, so that when we move, the stuff stays, the specimens stay inside that, uh, the bait box. Uh, it looks like it's going to get killed here, but you can, you'll see how incredibly flexible this stuff is. Even though it's hard coral, it's still very flexible. And this was still alive when we brought it back up to the surface. One of the major problems is getting it released, trying to get it untangled from the uh, tweezers. And then, of course, the lid closes down on it.
Well, besides sampling living coral, we also wanted to sample dead coral because these sometimes were larger and contained much more of a climate record. You see here all these brittle stars all over the seafloor. They often were covering the seafloor when there wasn't very much coral around. Uh, this particular coral turned out to be one of our better ones because it was about an inch in diameter as opposed to half inch in diameter for most of the small living ones. As with the living ones, these have to go into the sample boxes because otherwise they'd just be lost from the current. One of the few limiting factors in the ropo sting on the bottom is when you fill up all these uh, boxes, you want to be able to sample once they fill up. You've got to bring it up and empty this thing out. The other capability we have with this is being able to actually suction material off the corals. The biologists were very interested in finding out the associated fauna living on these corals, not just the fish, but shrimp, uh, sea urchins, other echinoderms, all kinds of different stuff. And one of the things we did, you can see that little hose to the right of the screen, is a suction hose. And what it does is suck stuff into those, those uh, canisters, which are all numbered. The reason we're looking at those was to get the numbers right. As you see the camera panning down, you're going to see it pan down to the coral and to where the suction head is. You see the suction head is just about to be turned on. It's trying to get things like that little shrimp that tried to run out of the way. And we ended up getting quite a few, probably several different types of species, small invertebrates living on this coral. You can see everything. The one shrimp at the top, I think he managed to escape but a lot of other things didn't manage to escape. So we got a pretty good assay of exactly what's living on these corals. We we're also interested in sucking up sediment. And we'll see in this clip, we actually put the head of the suction tube into the sediment and suck up the sediment around it. The seafloor here was largely a lag deposit. There was no real active sedimentation. So everything that was here is reworked. We wanted to see what kind of material was getting reworked and what kind of biologic remains were ending up in the sediment. So we sucked up a large amount of this stuff and put it in a, in a canister again and we're able to look at it. We look at it in different sieves. When this material sucks into these canisters, it sucks through different uh, mesh sizes. You can see we've got a, a big load of it here. Well, we moved over to a different site. You see mainly the boulder bottom. You see cod swimming around. This is because it's at nighttime, the cod seem to come down to the bottom. What you're looking at in the foreground there is a boulder that's been rolled over. This is not a natural process. It's almost certainly uh, been dragged. That's why you're not seeing very much coral. You see that coral actually growing up from underneath the boulder. So we move to another piece of coral or another part of the seafloor. There's a lot more coral and correspondingly a whole lot more fish. Uh, one thing you notice when you out in the Bay of Fundy is tremendous amount of particles in the water. These coral need particles to eat. That's what they're eating. That's probably why they're so abundant here. And one of the few times we see some other associated sea anemones, and just up in the right of the screen, you see a cod, uh, not something we commonly saw, nestled in the, in the coral just like the redfish have been doing throughout this entire video. Well, we did 13 separate dives with this cruise and with this vehicle and the week we were out there. Every time we had to bring it up, when we brought it up, we had to bring it up because the uh, sample containers were full. See, gently putting it on the deck. Um, and here we have part of the scientific staff looking at some of the corals. Uh, the Preminoa coral, which is a hard coral, and the Paragorgia, or the soft coral. This polyp's still out even though it's back on the surface. And even in daylight, it's even more spectacular than when we saw it actually undersea. Uh, Paul Mortensen was a coral expert from Norway. He was temporarily working for Department of Fisheries and Oceans, looking at one of the specimens he hopes to grow back in the lab. And these are some of the shrimp that we got off, uh, one of the suctions from some of the strawberry corals. These are some uh, brittle stars that we brought up doing uh, surface surveys of their densities. On the stern of the ship, we're looking at uh, sediment. This is Sanford Atwood, the chief person on this cruise who showed us where all the coral were. We're going through the sediment here, sieving it to isolate some of the material. And here's students and postdocs looking at some of the coral we brought back. 
Well, one of the reasons we're doing this is because we're all interested in global warming. And is it really occurring? And if it is, how fast is it happening? And one of the big problems with determining all this is having a record that's accurate enough and high resolution enough from the ocean to see if what we're seeing now is something that's only happening now or it's happened on a yearly, on a 50 year time period, 100 year, 200 year time period throughout the last 10,000 years. And the only way to get that is with these coral, because these coral provide us that annual record that we've never had before. It's like having a paleothermometer going back several thousand years into the geologic record. And it's the only way that we're going to find out exactly what's happening with global warming.